Elke dag zit u met zoveel vragen. Iedereen zoekt naar antwoorden. Persoonlijke antwoorden die ons kunnen sterken in ons geloof. Die antwoorden liggen soms voor het grijpen. Bereid u voor op Gods woorden die door de Bijbel tot u spreken. En vind de antwoorden met Bayless Conley. I think one of the inward questions that people have or one of the issues they grapple with is, is God mad at me? You know, I've, I've done so many things wrong. I've, I've trespassed against others. I've, I've failed to do what I should have done. Certainly, God must be mad at me. Well, we're going to be looking at that. And the truth is, is God loves broken things and broken people. He loves you. Here's Bayless Conley with part two of his continuing message from last week. And then we read verse 10 to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church or through the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Now, principalities and powers refer to both bad angels and good angels. You can look in Ephesians 6:12 later on if you want, where it talks about the forces of evil are Warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So it can refer to, to fallen angels, but it can also refer to good angels. 1 Peter 1.12, speaking of the gospel and the church and this mystery that has come to light, says this, that even the angels long to look into these things. And the manifold wisdom of God, the, the, the varied wisdom of God is declared and displayed through the church. And when all the fallen angels see it, they think, why did we ever crucify him? Look what we've done. We've sealed our own fate. We didn't know. And the good angels lift their hands and they say, oh God, thank you for your, your glorious wisdom and we praise you forever and ever. It's an amazing thing. And in the end of verse 9, it says, all things were created through Christ. But you know, God did not choose to showcase his wisdom through the mountains or the seas or through the earth or the moon or the sun or the stars or through the galaxies that are doing their choreographed dance throughout the universe, but through the church. God has chosen to display his wisdom. We read in chapter 2 that through the church from generation to generation, from age to age, stretching into eternity, there will be one thing that stands as a beacon and a revelation of God's amazing grace, and it is the church. And in this chapter, it says that God will reveal his wisdom through the church. How grand is his church? What an amazing privilege to be part of his church. And because we're in his church, part of his family, we can come to him without fear, without anxiety. Look in verse 12. It says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Meaning we, can, we have access to the Father. We can come to God with boldness and confidence. The word boldness literally means freedom of speech. It carries the idea that we can come without shame because of what Christ has done. We can come without fear because now we belong to God's family and we can boldly make our requests known to our heavenly Father. What a wonderful thing. This is the mystery that brought the church to birth that, that made us accepted into God's family, it's made us heirs and joint heirs with Christ so much that Jesus in John 16, when he's talking to the disciples, he said, in that day, talking about the day the mysteries revealed, the day of the church, in that day, he says, I won't go to the Father for you. But you go to the Father yourself and you just ask in my name because the Father himself loves you. In the next chapter in John 17, Jesus is praying and he says, Father, I know that you've loved them as you have loved me. It's more than the mind 
can take it. You are as welcomed in the presence of a holy God as the Savior Jesus Christ is because of what he has done for you. Oh, the immeasurable riches of redemption. We are not outcasts, we are not beggars, but we are family. We are the ones that have been chosen to display God's grace and his wisdom. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to have a trouble-free life. If you've been around at all, you know that's true. Look at verse 13. Therefore, I ask you that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. So don't lose heart when things happen that don't make sense. Still come to God with boldness and confidence and let your requests be made known. I mean, the Apostle Paul had led these Ephesians to Christ. He'd established the church there. And now their leader, their mentor, he's in chains in Rome. Some of them would have lost heart over that. Some of them would have said, I, I don't understand. You know, where, 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 where is God? But you know, God was working out his plan even while Paul was in prison. And frankly, it is an honor to suffer for Christ, as Paul makes clear in that verse. And from here, Paul begins to pray for them. And I'm going to make a few comments. Beginning in verse 14, he said, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. This is a great prayer to pray for others and for yourself. Pray for inward strength, not just for changed circumstances. Many, many people spend much effort and energy praying that God would change their circumstances. Very few people pray for inward strength. Someone once wisely said, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men. Pray for, do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. And then the first part of verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And certainly there's the idea of there of praying for the awareness of Christ's presence in your life, but I think there's, there's more than that. The word dwell means to settle down, to settle in and to make a permanent home. I remember when I went to college, now once I, I left home, I traveled around and lived in a few different states, and I eventually ended up in, in college up in Oregon. And I remember my first day, I actually lived in a dormitory for a year, and uh, walked in the room of my assigned, you know, dorm, and there's a guy, he's going to be my, my roommate sitting on one of the beds, and he was as different from me as you could imagine. He's got a military haircut. His clothing is way different than mine, and I am Mr. Hippie that's just walked into the room. I have very, very long hair. My clothes were, were radically different than his, and I dragged in a piece of driftwood that I had in my car, and I put it up in the room. I had this old ripped painting I'd got in a yard sale like five years before that I dragged all over creation. I put up this old ripped painting. I hauled all my, my records in, then I ripped off my shirt, and I flopped down on my bed. And I could tell he was freaking out, but I didn't say anything to him. <laughs> we later became friends. His name was Joe. Actually, we became good friends, and, and Joe confided in me one day. He says, Bayless, you know that day you walked into the dorm room? And you put down that weird piece of wood and put all your records down there and put that weird painting up. He said, I thought, oh my God, he's actually settling in here. I got to live with this guy for a year. Well, you know what? The question is, has Jesus really settled in in your life? He may not bring a piece of driftwood or some old painting or a bunch of John Fahey records but he will decorate the walls of your soul with peace and joy and confidence and purpose and security and faith and love. Has he settled down? Is he at home 
in your life. Goes on in verse 17. It says, And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. He talks about knowing something that surpasses knowledge. It's an interesting thing to say, isn't it? Somebody says, Pastor, why don't I feel that kind of love? Maybe you should start praying this kind of prayer. He's praying that they would know it. Friend, this is a Holy Spirit-inspired prayer. To be filled with all the fullness of God. It's one thing to be filled with God. Another thing to be filled with the fullness of God. Another thing yet to be filled with all the fullness of God. And to know his love. What would compel Jesus to leave heaven and to separate himself with the eternal, blissful fellowship he'd known with the Father throughout eternity past, to be born as a baby, to become a man of sorrows, to be persecuted, to be put to shame, to be nailed to a piece of wood, and to literally be killed by his own creation upon a cross. It'd be like you choosing to die for an ant, only infinitely beyond that. The answer is love. Love brought him from heaven. Love demanded his death on the cross. And we are invited now to begin the eternal quest of experiencing that love and knowing that love in us and through us to others. Some of the most amazing language in all of the Bible in these verses. Look in verse 20. Most of us know this one. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Once again, human language continues to stagger and to buckle under the weight of such thoughts. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. You know what? I can ask really big, and I can think even bigger. But God can do exceedingly more. I wonder if much of our praying is far too small. I wonder if when we get to heaven, we're going to go, oh, I could have had so much more. I could have done so much more. I could have experienced so much more. But I thought God was so small. You know, Bethany Harrison's wife, one of her brothers worked years back at the Montage, the hotel in Laguna Beach, at one of the restaurants there as a waiter. And there was a husband and wife that were staying at the Montage for a week, and they came into the restaurant one night, and her brother Ben waited on them. And when he came to give them the bill, the guy just handed him a credit card and said, look, whatever you think you're worth, write that as the tip. Whatever you think you're worth. Ben wrote $250. (laughs) Brought it. Guy didn't bat an eye. Filled out the check, paid it. Well, he and his wife came back to the restaurant the next night, and all the waiters and waitresses were fighting over who got to serve him. <laughs> and he did it again the next night. He told, it was, I think, a waitress the second night. He says, hey, whatever you think you're worth, just write it down. $500. Didn't bat an eye. Just paid it. Next night, came back again. And this, this went on like for, for six nights in a row, five or six nights in a row. It got up to the, the, the final one, wrote $1,000. Guy didn't bat an eye, just paid it. And when I heard that story, I couldn't believe it. I thought, why not put 10000 down? <laughs> why not put 50000 down? 
Why not write a million? I mean, to some people, that's like 20 bucks. I mean, all he could have done was say no, and I wonder if we do that with God. When he supplies our need, he does it according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The story's told of a famous golfer here in the U.S. This is decades and decades back. Was actually invited by a, uh, a king in one of the oil-rich Middle Eastern countries to come play golf. And, and he was reticent to respond. He wasn't going to do it. But his friend said, yeah, you should do it. So he agreed to come. And then the, this sheik or king, he sends his private jet over to get him, flies him all the way over to the country, and they spend three days golfing, had three wonderful days. And when he's getting ready to get on the jet and, and, and fly back, the king said, listen, these, these days have been very memorable for me, and I want to thank you. I'd love to give you a gift. What can I give you? And he said, look, nothing. I don't need anything. This, is, this has been great. He said, no, please. And he could see that the king was not going to relent. He says, well, he said, I collect golf clubs. It's, it's my, as well as playing, I just, I collect, you know, rare golf clubs. Um, maybe find a golf club for me. King said, okay, done. And on the way back, he's thinking, man, what kind of a golf club would a king give? Is he going to give me a, a gold putter with my name etched in it? What is this going to be, a, a, a you know, gem-encrusted seven iron? What, what? And he got to thinking about it and started watching the mailbox for like the next week or so. And I think it was two weeks later, he gets a registered letter from the king, opens it up, and it is a deed to a 500-acre, 18-hole golf course and he realized that when he said a golf club, the king thought he meant <laughs> a golf club. Because the word can mean both. Kings think differently than we do. How about King Jesus, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think regarding inner strength, regarding what he does in our church, regarding your kids, regarding your retirement, regarding your job, he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or think. And then he finishes in verse 21. To him be glory in or through the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. First grace through the church and then wisdom through the church and now glory through the church. You want to be part of it? There's only one way. Embracing his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You bow your heads, close your eyes if you would. Oh, Heavenly Father, help these hearts of ours to grow. You said that you gave Solomon largeness of heart like the sand by the sea. Lord, expand these hearts of ours. Our faith is challenged when we read such words, but we know that you mean them. Lord, you so intricately, methodically worked out your plan. And we know that even as individuals, you're working in our lives, though we may not be able to see it going forward. Looking back, we'll be able to say, oh God, you're astonishing wisdom. We trust you tonight, Lord. We thank you that you've sent your son to redeem us and to make us part of this great revealed mystery called the church. We just invite you, Holy Spirit, to move in our midst, through our hearts, Thank you for breathing on your church, oh God. 
Thank you for reviving your church, oh God. Thank you for giving us a fresh visitation of your spirit, oh God. Fresh illumination concerning our mission together as a family. But our part is individual members of that family. Lord, we bless you. Please, every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm just going to take another moment. And I uh, just want to invite you to pray with me. If you've never asked the Savior into your life, listen, Jesus died for the sin of the world. I can't say more. He paid the price. He's real. He was raised from the dead on the third day because the claims of God's eternal justice were forever satisfied. And what he did, he did in your stead on your behalf, in your place. And this marvelous thing we've been talking about tonight, for you, it's a prayer away. The Bible says if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess him with your mouth as Lord, that God will bring you into this relationship with himself called salvation. It makes you a part of his church, part of his family gives you access and so much more. I'm just going to ask before I pray, if you know you need to pray this prayer, if you want to pray this prayer with me, you may be a backslider that needs to come home, a prodigal son, prodigal daughter, and you're tired of living around the perimeter. You know you can't enjoy sin when you know the truth about Jesus, and you certainly are not enjoying Christ when you're sinning. And for you, it's time to come home, prodigal son, prodigal daughter. So I want to invite you to respond as well. And to the person that may have never uttered such a prayer, let me assure you, this is not about signing some list of things you're no longer allowed to do. It's not about ceremony or ritual. It's about you having life. It's about you finding out the purpose for which you were created. It's about you having your sin washed away and becoming part of something glorious that spans the globe. If you want in on the prayer, nobody looking around but me, just put your hand up right now all over the auditorium. Just put it up, let me acknowledge it. After I acknowledge the hands, you can put them down, then we'll pray together. A lot of hands, just keep them up for a minute. I see them. I just want a minute to look around. It's awesome, okay, okay, good. Wonderful, all right, put those hands down. Let's pray together. So maybe say this out loud if you would. You say, oh God, I humble myself before you. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for thinking of me. Thank you for sending your own son who died on the cross for the sins of the world. Jesus, thank you for going to that cross. I believe you died and were raised from the dead. And I invite you now to come into my life, Lord Jesus. From this moment forward, all I am and all I have, I place in your hands and I choose to follow you. It's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus, amen. Awesome. Awesome. So good. Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. You know, sometimes something as simple as praying a, a prayer like you just watched us pray together in the church can make all of the difference in the world, that difference being your heart. The Bible says that God doesn't see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And if even you pray a, a, a stumbling, halting prayer, but if your heart's behind it and you really want God in your life, you really want help from Him, you really want to know His Son, Jesus Christ, God will answer your prayer. Just let your heart and your lips connect. Speak words to God. Be sincere and you will find out that he is not very far away at all. In fact, I just wanna, wanna put this out there. I don't think it's a coincidence that you're listening to me right now. 
I think God has set you up and he wants to change your life. Talk to him. Do it now. Heeft u genoten van deze boodschap? Bestel dan de volledige preek op cd of dvd. De contactgegevens staan nu in beeld. We bidden dat u blijft groeien in wijsheid, geloof en de kracht van Gods woord. And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. You know, hundreds of years before the events happened, Isaiah prophesied by the Holy Spirit about the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. You can read about it in Isaiah chapter 53. And some of the things that it says there, that he was despised, that he was rejected. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, but he didn't open his mouth, though he could have opened his mouth. He could have called legions of angels, but he allowed himself you know, to be beaten and to be taken to the cross, to be rejected, to be despised. And, you know, he did those things as a substitute. If you think about it, Jesus was rejected by the very world he created. He was rejected by the brothers that he grew up with. He was rejected by the nation from which he sprang. And ultimately, he was rejected even by his heavenly Father as the sin of the world was laid upon him and he became our sin substitute. The Father turned his back upon him when he was on the cross, where Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From that moment, he identified completely with mankind's curse. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. And the good thing is that he did that so that we need never experience it. He was rejected by God so that we could be accepted by God. Listen to these verses from Ephesians chapter one, if you would, verse six, to the praise of his glory, the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. When Jesus raised from the dead, when he was raised from the dead, he did it as our substitute. And in the eyes of God, we are in him. He died as our substitute. He was raised from the dead. And when the Father looks at Jesus, he sees us. We're accepted by the Father in him. I am so excited about my upcoming trip to Europe. We'll be in Germany, we'll be in Switzerland, we will be in the Netherlands, three countries that I absolutely love and more importantly, that God absolutely loves. If you've never been out to one of our meetings, find out where they are, do all you can to come out. I would love to meet you, hope to see you at one of those meetings. Kennen Sie das? Ihre Freundin kommt andauernd zu spät. Sie schenken ihr deshalb eine Uhr oder lieber gleich ein paar Wecker. Und Ihr Partner will schon wieder nicht mit in den Gottesdienst. Dabei versuchen Sie es schon so lange, ihn zu überreden. Und die Kinder fragen wieder nach Süßigkeiten, obwohl sie schon oft erklärt haben, wie ungesund das ist. Oft möchten wir unseren Mitmenschen helfen, sich zum Guten zu verändern. Und doch bleibt alles, wie es ist. Gehen Sie es anders an. Auf dieser DVD erklärt Bayless Conley, wie tiefgehend und nachhaltig der Heilige Geist das Leben von Menschen verändern kann und was Ihre Rolle dabei ist. Bestellen Sie die DVD Überlass es dem Heiligen Geist. Jetzt im Internet oder rufen Sie uns an.